Hallelujah, church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hasn't God been good to you this week? Ah, isn't he wonderful? Isn't he great? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus. This time we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. If you have a need in your body, just lift your hands. Lord, we come to you right now, God. Lord, we pray for every need, every situation in this service today, God. Lord, we pray for this message that's going to be brought forth, whether it be teaching or preaching, God. Lord, I'm anoint our pastor, God. Anoint our minds to understand it, God, and our hearts to receive it, Jesus, Lord, in your name. Hallelujah. Why don't we give the Lord another hand clap of praise? <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. So thankful for the presence of God. And I tell you what, I'm so thankful for what I believe God's going to do in this place today. We, second service, we got two already scheduled to be baptized in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Wednesday night, I didn't know it to after service, but we had one to receive the Holy Ghost right over here in Children's Church. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. As a kid, were you ever tormented by a verbal bully who was maybe a little wittier or faster than you? Then you probably have used, if so, these two words. Oh, yeah? You know, that bully pushing you to the moment. Oh, yeah? And, you, and you're, you're just letting that bully know. I'm not going to let you push me around. But have you ever longed for a biblical, oh yeah, that you could throw back into the face of the devil when he comes to you to assault you and to accuse you? When you are without argument in the face of his demonic bombardment, have you ever wished for a final, unstoppable, oh yeah, that could shut the mouth of hell? There is a word, a great word, just one word that you can use, and it's simply this, nevertheless, nevertheless. You see, nevertheless is a word bridge that connects two ideals, the first of which has no power, never even though it is factual, it has no power to lessen the great truth of the second. I could look at Brother Sager today and say, I don't believe that you own a Ford. And he could say, well, that's your opinion, but nevertheless, my vehicle's sitting out in the parking lot. Two of them, he said. Nevertheless, builds a firewall between truth and fact, they are not the same. Nevertheless, says, that may be so. It may be exactly as you stated it. But it is utterly lacks the strength to erode the truth that it hopes to diminish. Nevertheless, it's the most efficient rebuttal to any argument. And it is the tool of great confidence. You can state facts if you want, but I cannot be shaken from the truth that I know. You know, if you'll learn today how to use this one Bible word, nevertheless, and in the face of life's most difficult circumstances, you will never be defenseless if you'll learn to use this word. Let's examine today the power of this biblical, oh yeah. The nevertheless of a hard thing. You see, the prophet Elijah had just finished his work. His assistant, Elijah, his, sensed in his spirit that God was soon going to take his mentor back to heaven or take him to heaven. So the unknown future hung very heavy in the air, almost more real than the present. 
Elijah said, you stay here at Gilgal. I am going to Bethel. As the Lord lives, Elisha replied, I will not let you out of my sight. That is the way it went all day. It was like Elijah was trying to lose him. Whether it be at Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and finally the Jordan River with the waters parted at the snap of the elder prophet's mantle. But finally Elijah turns and he says, we both know what is about to happen. So ask what you will, Elijah. What do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away? But Elijah's answer come very quickly. Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And Elijah's reaction is equally quick. You have asked a hard thing. Now, never once in their journeys has Elisha heard these words from Elijah. When they were blinding an army, when they were praying down fire from heaven, when they were holding back the rain, toppling the house of a wicked king Ahab, none of these things did Elijah say was too hard or was a hard thing. But a double portion, that is a hard to do. Second Kings 2 and 10, he said, and he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing, but nevertheless, if thou see me, when I am taken away from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Such a terrifying sight comes straight at them. A chariot and horses of fire out of the sky. It drove right between them like a lightning bolt. But Elijah's eyes, brother nation, never left Elijah. Don't look away, Elijah. Your promise depends upon it. Your double portion depends upon it. Most Bible readers will tell you that the chariot of fire is what took Elijah to heaven, but that ain't what the word of God says. Check it out. The Bible says that a whirlwind took him away. The chariot was a distraction. But Elijah kept his focus. Elijah had indeed asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, because he kept his spiritual energies focused, he received Elijah's mantle. Years later, as he laid there dying, Elijah was visited by the king Joash, who was afraid of the Syrians. The prophet had him to shoot an arrow out the window. And he declared it the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. He then, then commanded Joash to take his other arrows and to strike the ground, assuming that he would realize that this was a very prophetic moment. When Joash only struck the ground three times, Elijah became, Brother McDaniel, very angry. Here was a young man, like many modern Christians, who do not strike enough, who do not seek, cry, pray, or ask big enough. But when God says hit, then hit and keep on hitting until the hard thing happens. Uh, don't be afraid, saint of God, to ask big. Uh, the Bible lets us know and it indicates that God is more impatient with the timid huh, than, than he is with the aggressive. Hebrews 4 and 16 lets us know, let us therefore come boldly upon the throne of grace that we may attain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. With every great undertaking, there will always be Job's comforters around to tell you what is impossible, what is impractical, what is impulsive, what is imperfect, and what is improbable. 
There will always be a Sambalit and a, and, a, and a Tobiah at your elbow to tell you how unachievable your dreams is, your desires, and your goals are. Huh? Such voices of discouragement are a dime a dozen. That's Nehemiah, the wall builder, uh, who had the perfect answer in the face of an army of dream killers. Uh, he said in Nehemiah 11, 4 and 9, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and we set a watch against them day and night because of them. I encourage you today, pray hard, work hard, trust God to do the hard things on your behalf and don't listen to the critics. Then we got the nevertheless of a sure foundation. The words did not originate with some late night comic or sharp witted politician or even an ancient philosopher. But in their original form, they belonged to Jesus who knew that the enemies of truth run in packs. He said in Matthew 7 and 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raven wolves. Paul also anticipated an onslaught of liberalism against the infant church after his death. False brethren armed with personalities, education, charisma, intellect, but mostly with appetites to devour the faith of defenseless little lambs. In Acts 20 and 29 through 30, he said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Uh, also of your own self shall man arise, uh, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Uh, they are cowards, he's saying, for the most part. They're wanting to lure the young, young and, and the innocent uh, away from the foe, away from the flock, so they can pounce on them with their mockery and their argument and their intimidation. Uh, and our immoral society, even in 2024, loves these tolerant, liberal, sophisticated Christians because of their lax lifestyle. It does not create conviction or it does not break the status quo or disturb their comfort zone. Hallelujah. Youthful, innocent, brand new converts are lacerated without pity and even made to feel guilty for their holy and separated lifestyle by liberal so-called Christians with their false freedoms and in such antagonist religious atmosphere believers especially young believers need an irrefutable undebatable answer that dismisses these adversaries and strengthens their faith that answer which by the way infuriates the new breed of false so-called Christians uh, is found in clear calm syllables of this nevertheless uh, nevertheless you may find yourself at the end of your own intellect when attempted to defend your faith against those who have spent maybe years honing their argument to a fine edge but no matter how bright, no matter how well prepared you are, you may eventually come up against a brighter and more better prepared opponent to say that they have the truth. I'm just saying how it works. But if you'll arm yourself with the ultimate answer, you'll never be defeated. Wait until they spend all of their energy, use up all of their intellectual ammunition, and stand triumphant over what they expect you to be in a defeated form. And when the naysayer says, there, what do you have to say about that? Just one word is all that you have to say without a hint of panic. Nevertheless, I'm going to live for God. Nevertheless. Uh, but, but, but it seems like your whole world is falling apart since you started going to church. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep going to church. <laughs> it seems like since you started paying your tithes and your offering that you have, nevertheless, I'm going to keep doing what I'm supposed to do. 
It seems like the more faithful you are, the harder it gets. Nevertheless, I'm going to keep living for God. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Hallelujah. Enemy, after all of your arguments, and despite your obvious intellect, you cannot tear down the foundation of God in your life, in my life. I don't need to even defend it. 2 Timothy 2 and 19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now I want to move forward with the nevertheless of trials. Nowhere does the Bible promise that saints of God will have a life of ease. In fact, many scriptures say the exact opposite. Psalm 34 and 19, it tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. We sometimes try to impose on God our limited understanding of fairness. And we quickly find out that he will not submit because there's nowhere in that book that he promised that everything's fair. A mother of three must have three equal candy bars or else she will have to divide the one she has into three equal portions. Never, or hopefully she wouldn't, never would she give the candy to one child and ask the other two children to rejoice while they watch him eat. Yet that is precisely what God does. He lifts one Christian to public prominence and great blessings before the eyes of the world while another is allowed to pour out their life in service and die in hardship and suffering. God's dealing with humanity it defies our expectations and our little formulas of faith. Only one word can ever make sense of it all and can bring a sense of joy and victory to every life. No matter how much suffering, no matter how much blessing it contains, hallelujah, no matter what this life, whether it's hardship or whether it's blessing, there is one word that can make sense of it all, nevertheless. Nevertheless, I'm going to do the will of God. Satan had practiced his arguments, has practiced his arguments for thousands of years. He's learned his lines well. He never misses an opportunity to accuse God and to accuse God's people. There's is your God for you. He lets you work like a slave, pray without ceasing, pour out your heart, give to you drop. Then he rewards you with trials and suffering. Do we deny these facts? No. Well, what do we do? What do we have to say in response to Satan? Just one word, devil. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Remember the definition? Nevertheless is a bridge between two opposing set of facts. The first of which my suffering cannot invalidate or dilute the latter, God's goodness. 2 Timothy 1 and 12 tells us, for the which cause I also suffer these things, but nevertheless... I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You see, Paul balanced out his suffering with two strong facts. I know whom I have believed. Even though I may not understand it, I still trust God and that is enough for me. I may never never have the answers why I'm in this world walking on this earth but nevertheless God is faithful hallelujah I am persuaded that he is able Paul said to keep 
Nothing I have ever done for God, nothing that you have ever done for God is lost. And because, why? God is the one keeping the records. And as the old timers always used to say, God keeps good notes. He promises that eternity will be the ultimate equalizer. If you ever felt unappreciated or even unnoticed, here's one word that keeps your spirit up, nevertheless. We have the nevertheless of obedience. Jesus' command seemed like mockery to the sweating, exhausted fishermen. It was broad daylight, and even a carpenter would should know that you cannot catch fish on the Sea of Galilee in broad daylight. Peter and the others had labored all night long, and now they're very tired, very weak. Now this prophet from the, the landlocked village of Nazareth is spouting off direction as though he knows something about fishing. Peter has the right to feel fatigued. And more than a little frustrated. All right. Peter's thinking I'll do it. I'll cast the nets out one more time. But not without letting everyone know what I think is a stupid ideal. If this carpenter wants nets, he'll get nets. Wet, heavy, empty nets. But in spite of Peter's reluctance, and maybe even a little bit of rebellion within him. Peter decides to accept with one powerful word. Uh, Luke 5 and 5 says, And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have told all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, uh, I will let down the net. So Brother Mills, Peter didn't have no rebellion in him. He done it. The Lord told him to let down nets. He let down nets. Hallelujah. You can halfway do the will of God. Suddenly, Peter's done. Never, not on the greatest night of fishing, has Peter ever had a catch like this. So many fish. See, we often labor under the illusion that all obedience must be joyful. Don't be unreasonable. There, there may well be burdens. There may well be demands placed on us by the Lord that makes more sense than fishing in the daylight did to Peter. And it's permissible to tell God that you do not understand. Understand, God will let you talk. He is sovereign. But Brother Worley, he's not rude. He'll let you talk. You've heard me say it many a times, and other people say it. We talk about, I've heard people say it all my life. You can't question God. Show me where that's in the book. It's not in there. Job questioned God, but he did not charge God foolishly. There's the line. It's okay to take your questions to God. How can I catch my cares, my anxieties upon him? Is what that word means without having questions. But in the end, nevertheless, I'm still don't trust him. I still don't have confidence in him. Hallelujah. God is not upset by your, your explanations as to why the situation is impossible for you. So let God hear it all. However, when you're finished telling him why it does not make sense to you, and he answers with silence, be sure to obey with the one word that will unlock the miraculous in your life, nevertheless. Miraculous, supernatural, abundant blessings await the exhausted workers who will, despite their own common sense, cast their nets just one more time in obedience to the Lord. The more unlikely the command, the greater the miracle. 
First comes the nevertheless. Then comes the miracle. So when you're so, when you're too tired, when dealing with this thing called life, when maybe you're too young, maybe you're too old, maybe you're too poor, too unknown, too burdened, too imperfect, too unspiritual to obey God's voice. Tell him all about it. Let him know your complaints and then answer with the word that he wants to hear. Regardless, Lord, nevertheless. Galatians 6 and 9 tells us, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. The nevertheless of Calvary. The demons danced around him in his agony as he tries to pray in the garden of Gethsemane. And those torture and mental images, I believe, of what laid ahead for the Lord begin to rip at his soul. Soon will come the crucifixion that will deliver him at the hands of others. He looks I can imagine he looked between his hands where they claw at the massive rocks, rocks, excuse me, where he prayed. Is it raining? No, it's blood. Is it raining blood? No. He finally realizes that the blood is his own. He had prayed until his sweat become as great drops of blood dripping as it marks the agonizing passing of time. Tick, 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 drip, drip, drip. His voice quavers, and he raises its pitch to a near wail. And I can hear him as he begins to pray. Luke 22 and 42 saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. The fleshly side of the Lord did not want to go through with this. As much as he was God, he was man. God manifested in the flesh. If there is another way, how many times have you been there? How many times have I been there that we go to God and say, God, I want your will to be done. But Lord, if there's any other way, <laughs> God, if you can rewrite the script. God, I really would prefer to do it this way. I really prefer not to have to do this, God. But in the end, we got to do exactly what he done. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The demons do their, then the demons begin to do their worst and having shown him all the pain that awaits him, having displayed uh, before him the humiliating pictures. I could, I could only imagine what's going on through his mind of his, the, his naked body suspended cruelly for all to see, having tormented his imagination with the images of hell itself. They now show him the most horrible thing of all. Brother McDaniels, my sins and your sins. I can hear Satan asking him, would you die for him? My depraved indifference, my lying tongue, my blackest deeds, the arrogant self-worship that was paraded before his, his pleading soul must surely have been the most torture of all to die to sacrifice, to lay down one's life for the great or even the good is one thing, but to fling one's life into the sewer for a perverted sinful flesh. To die in the very arms of hell for a degenerated, hell-bent wretch is nothing but it seems like to me and you a reckless waste that must have been completely confusing the minds of the horrified angels that looked upon. So he prays. 
Take it away. Please, Father, don't make me drink from this cup. Can you hear the other prayer in Gethsemane? It's hardly audible. Merely a whisper almost entirely drowned out by the mockings of the demons, by the sobbing of our Lord. But if you listen close, you can make it out. It's my prayer. It's your prayer. Please, Jesus, don't listen to the devil. Please, Jesus, don't even ask to be excused from this dreadful destiny. For if this cup passes from your lips, Lord, if it passes from your lips and it passes on to mine where it rightfully belongs, I will have to drink from its torment for eternity. Please, Jesus. Satan mocks. Will you toss away your life for garbage like this? You have asked that the cup pass from your lips. Is that your last word? Why waste all you are for someone like this? Are you so great a fool? And with a sweep of his hand, I could see Satan as he gestures dramatically towards the masses of humanity yet unborn. Look at all of them. Do you really expect them all to repent? Do you really expect all of them to believe and obey the truth and be born again of the water and the spirit? Most of them never will. And for once, Satan has told the truth and Jesus knows it. Most of the human race, most of us will never be anything but what we are. We will not believe anything but our own self-deceptions. What a waste that Jesus will go through all of this agony only to see millions and billions still cast into hell because they will not come to him for the free salvation that has cost him so much. The physical pain awaiting him on the cross will be the least of his agony. You see, never, not even for a second, has sin ever entered into the life of Jesus. But now he knows that on the cross, he must become all the sin that the human race has ever committed or ever will commit. It will rip his humanity from his deity in a soul rich in agony that even heaven itself cannot comprehend. He will die alone and forsaken. Jesus Christ will not only bear our sin here, but he will become our sin, the Bible tells us. What can that even mean? It has to be the worst fear of all. But in spite of sin, all that lies ahead. Jesus lifts up his weary voice one more time to pray. And he says the one word that will save a human race that deserves no saving. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. And heaven and earth rejoiced. Nevertheless, and hell's arguments are brought to nothing. Nevertheless, and the great gulf between the horrible truth about me and the horrible truth about you and God's incredible love for me and God's incredible love for you is eternally bridged with the bridge of nevertheless. Psalms 85 and 10 lets us know that mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. In that one word where Jesus said, nevertheless, Jesus says so much, very more about his love for me, his love for you. He does not deny that all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. He does not deny that we are all sinners saved by the grace of God. He does not gloss over our wickedness. He sees it all. But he says, as powerful as the stench of our sin is, 
it can never make God's love any less. Despite all of the devil's rational arguments to the contrary, despite knowing the horror that he will endear, despite humanity's rejection of their only Savior, despite our filthiness and rebellion, Jesus chooses the cross with one great word, nevertheless. Remember again that definition, nevertheless, is a bridge between two opposing set of facts, the first of which my sin cannot invalidate or even dilute the latter, God's love. Jesus was not saving us from God when he died. He was saving us from ourselves. I don't have to wonder today if God loves me. He proved it on Calvary with a nevertheless. There is no epistle to the Athens in the New Testament because they were the only city that literally laughed at Paul's message when he preached on Mars Hill. Other cities experienced revival, or at least a good right, when Paul preached. But here among the philosophers, he was ignored. It must have been incredibly discouraging to preach Jesus for Paul and to get nothing in return. And it still is. And yet there was a glimmer of hope among the hundreds of refusals. Paul said in Acts 17 and 34, how be it, and that word there in the Greek means nevertheless, nevertheless, certain man clave unto him and believed. The only question that we have sitting here on April the 28th, 2024, after all that Jesus has done, what will you do? Will there be a nevertheless in your life that no matter what I face, no matter what situations come my way, I may not understand them. Huh? I may not have the answers but I can have a nevertheless. I told this story before in, in another message that I preached. In fact, I talked about this message Wednesday night about can you trust God in the dark, but I remember many a times I would go to sagely maybe to my father, him being my pastor for 18 years or and, and I are actually 20 years. And I, I would go to him and I would say, I, I just would lay it all out on the table. I sincerely wanted help. I sincerely wanted the word of wisdom. Let me, let me put it to you in our terms. I sincerely wanted a, a magic wand. I wanted the trouble to go away. I wanted the problems to go all the way. And sometimes my dad would give me the most, the best answer he could give me while at the same time giving me the answer that I did not want to hear. Well, let's just pray about it. Well, nation, that wasn't that what I wanted to hear. I'm just be honest. I've been praying about it. I wanted something that was going to fix it right then, roll the dark clouds away, just make it, let the sun shine again. Here I am dealing with this again, God. And he said, let's just pray about it. If I could rephrase what he was saying, he was saying, we don't keep praying, but you've got to have a nevertheless in your life. That though he slay me, yet I'll trust him. There's some things that we are going to deal with in this life that we will never get the answers to. 
And I, I've said it just like you said it before. Man, I can't wait to get to heaven. But when I get to heaven, I got a stack of questions I want to ask God about. I promise you, when you get there, that's going to be the last thing on your mind. <laughs> that's going to be the last thing on your mind. And uh, you're just going to be glad that you kept a nevertheless in your life, that when you didn't feel like coming to church, you had a nevertheless and you kept coming to church. When you didn't feel like living for God, you kept, my God, I don't understand what's going on. When you had no money in your pocket, nevertheless, I'm going to keep serving him. I, he's never done me nothing but good. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so I encourage you today to keep a nevertheless in your life and allow God to direct our footsteps in our path. The, the Bible says he, he, he'll direct us. The problem of it is he only shows us a couple steps at a time. Because if he showed us the whole path, we'd take off quicker than what we're supposed to. But it's, and we think we didn't need God. But instead... He shows us that he'll direct those footsteps and those pathways. Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Ooh. Starting to feel pretty good now, Brother Sajan. Hallelujah. I was sick all day yesterday and uh, never hardly made it off the couch. And uh, I'm not running no fever right now. I was running it all day yesterday. It broke in the middle of the night. And thank God. And a uh, bad headache and just very nausea and everything. But nevertheless, I was ready to come to church today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not saying not saying I felt like it, but I, I promise you, uh, when the anointing started started hitting, I started feeling pretty good and everything. So thankful for each and every one that's here, and we're excited about what God is going to do in this second service, believing in God for great things. Shake hands. You're dismissed. We'll pick back up here in a minute.